And so welcome to the financial step, Seven Steps to Financial Freedom webinar. We've got a lot to cover. So without further ado, let's dive in. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Grant Sabatier. I'm the author of Financial Freedom. The book came out last year. It's in over 10 languages. I'm the creator of MillennialMoney.com which is a personal finance, investing, and entrepreneurship website. Since I launched it in 2015, over 20 million people have visited the website. I went from $2.26 to $1.25 million in five years, reaching financial independence shortly after turning 30. Uh, after that time, I made a plan to uh, leave my full-time career and basically retire early but I didn't stay quote unquote retired very long because I ended up uh, starting a millennial money in 2015, writing about money. And then uh, the blog started growing and I had so much joy teaching what I'd learned about personal finance that I dedicated my life or at least my life at this phase to sharing everything that I've learned about money and trying to help other people reach financial independence. So I've been in a lot of media. Now I spend my time traveling and teaching. Before we dig too deep, I just want to tell you uh, very quickly about the Financial Freedom Summit. It's May 1st through 3rd in 2020 in St. Louis. It's an event where I've invited all of my friends who I think are the best in the personal finance space to talk about financial freedom, how they reached financial freedom. The goal is ultimately to help uh, you, no matter where you are in your own financial journey, take the next step. It's going to be an incredible event. Likely over a thousand people are going to be there. There's going to be four tracks, one on earning, optimizing your full job full-time job, launching a side hustle. We're going to talk a lot about these topics today, but of course, in an hour, I can only go so deep. And then uh, there's going to be a saving and investing track as well as an entire mindset track. And we're going to dig deep into all facets of financial freedom. And the coolest thing about the event is that all of the speakers have reached financial freedom or are very close. Everyone's living life on their own terms. It truly is a remarkable time to be alive. And so uh, I'm so excited about the summit. I'm going to answer questions about it. People from all walks of life have already signed up. It's going to be an incredible event. There's really nothing like it. I've been to tons of money events and there's absolutely nothing like it. And I'm so pumped to bring all my friends together and, and you know, just have an incredible time. So uh, check out the Financial Freedom Summit. Use the code FREEDOM for 20% off and I'll be answering questions about it in the AMA. So I wanted to set a little bit of context here because it's important when thinking about financial freedom to set the context. So we live in a society that's really negative. Uh, if you read the news at all, what you hear is that student loan debt is at all time highs. Credit card debt is at all time highs. The cost of living continues to increase. Uh, wages have stagnated. We're earning less money as millennials than our parents did. Americans are saving less than 3% uh, of their income. We're going into a recession at any minute. Depression and anxiety rates are at all-time highs and through the roof. Uh, if you read the news, a lot of what's written about money is extremely negative. And if you fixate on that, and I get emails about this all the time, if you just fixate on those negative statistics, it, they become self-validation. And so if, if you have student loan debt, a lot of people have student loan debt. Student loan debt is something that you can build a simple strategy to get out of it and not let it cripple you. And definitely you should be investing uh, and building your financial life, even if you have student loan debt. And so we get all this negative information that it's not possible to save money. It's so hard. The cards are stacked all against us. But in reality, we actually uh, live in a time when it's never been easier in history to live a life that you love. And this is really what financial freedom is all about to me. It's the focus of the summit, the talks at the summit. We live in a time where there's so many incredible opportunities. Yes, we have all the debt. Yes, we have all these statistics, but it's never been easier to make enough money to live a life you love. And I'm gonna break this down throughout this webinar to talk a little bit about it. But the important thing 
to note here. And one of the reasons why I underline it is you live a life you love, um, not a life that, you know, your friend loves or your parents loved or your coworker loved, a life that you love. And that's really, really important because a lot of us, you know, as you know, we, we grow up with this one idea of success, this one idea that we need two cars and a house and a long commute and a job. And it's really, really important. We're going to talk about it, doing the work to figure out what you want, not what you think you want based on how you grew up or the society that we live in. So this that's a really important piece. But there's some incredible things about the time that we live in. And, you know, literally people 50, 100 years ago, in a lot of ways, would be jealous of the world that we live in, because um, there is opportunities for social mobility, there's opportunities for geographic mobility. Oftentimes, when you grew up uh, throughout most of history, you were born into a career or a trade, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to, to change your circumstances in life. And so unemployment, now it's at record lows. Uh, and that means the demand for talent has actually flipped. And so in a lot of cases, as an employee, you have so much more leverage uh, than you perhaps that you realize. I mean, l literally every company is almost every company is looking to hire now. They're paying higher and higher wages. It's tougher to keep talent very difficult to be an employer. It's an incredible time to be an employee because you actually have more leverage. Your, if your company wants to keep you, you can use that as negotiating power to get a raise. And we'll dive into that a little bit more. Shopping online, all the amazing extensions, Wikibuy, Honey, uh, the apps, you know, Ibotta, Paribus, all these swag, all these incredible apps that exist that make it so much easier to shop online and get lower prices. And just the democratization of internet, uh, of information. One of the things, the pair of Levi jeans that I really love, uh, the 513s, I set an alert on Google. And when they go on sale, I go pick up uh, pairs. You know, I can buy a pair of jeans for 15 or $20 in an online deal. I need a couple a year and I'm able to spend less than $300 a year on clothes by setting those alerts. I mean, information is available everywhere. We have location flexibility uh, so much more than ever before, which gives us not only opportunities to make more money, but more flexibility with our time. So I'm seeing a lot of cool things happening where people in all different industries, because they can work remotely, they're working for a company that's based out of New York or Chicago or LA or Dallas, Texas, and they're able to get the those wages like they would live in those cities, but they're actually living in much lower cost of living areas, places like Idaho, Minnesota, other places in the Midwest, uh, even abroad, and they're able to make big city salaries, but live in low cost of living areas and ultimately invest the difference. Um, the internet's opened up incredible opportunities for side hustling. You can learn almost anything for free online. You know, YouTube is just immensely, immensely incredible in terms of learning new skills. Everything I know about accounting, I've learned on YouTube. Everything I know about running Google campaigns, I learned on YouTube. There's incredible high quality, low cost investing opportunities. So it used to be much harder to invest. But with the rise of the index fund, with the rise of robo advisors, with all the fee wars that are happening now at all the banks and the brokerage firms, it's so much easier to invest in a low cost way. And so, and then finally, there's just access to other life blueprints. And this is probably the thing that excites me the most because of the internet, there's just such an open culture of sharing. And so that's one of the things that I'm trying to bring together at the summit is people who have chosen to live life on their own terms and they're writing about it. They have blogs, they have podcasts, they have books. Uh, they're, they're completely open to sharing how they did it. And so it's a lot easier now to read a book and be like, oh, that's how that person lived their life. I can learn from them. I can follow in their footsteps, which uh, makes it a lot easier in a lot of cases to reach financial freedom. Uh, one other important piece, it's important to acknowledge that the game itself, the game of money, in a lot of cases is completely rigged. It's not fair. Some people, based on where they're born, uh, have advantages. The fact that I'm a white guy in 2020 gave me certain advantages. The fact that I was an only child gave me certain advantages. Even though the game is rigged and it's not fair, you can choose how you want to play it and what winning means. And that's an important piece, too, because a lot of people, when they think about the money game, what winning means is having millions of dollars or having 
a bigger house or a bigger car or more possessions than the person who lives next door to you. But you can choose what winning means. And that's extremely important. You know, you can't control where you're born, who your parents are, where you grew up, where you went to high school, what you look like. But I've noticed that in all, you know, my book tour and in so many of my conversations, there tends to be two types of people. And I know this is a real oversimplification, but there's people that say, you know, I can't because I have student loan debt or I have credit card debt or, you know, I, I didn't go to a great school. And then there are people who say, you know, I can. And I know this is a real simplification, but I see this attitude consistently where um, if you're in debt, if you grew up with few opportunities, some of the most successful side hustlers I know are teachers are you know people who have three and four kids are the people who all the odds are stacked against them, but they're able to make it happen ultimately because they see that there is an opportunity, especially in the age that we live in, to build a life that you love, that you want, to pivot in your career, to uh, take a year off, to spend more time with your parents, spend more time with your kids. Uh, you don't have to live that traditional nine to five work for the next 30 years life that was, you know, historically for the past 100 plus years, really the status quo. Money itself, it's a numbers, it's an emotional game. There's so much conflicting information out there. Uh, money attracts a lot of scammers. It's tough to weed through that sometimes. So that can make it tough to find the right information. Another reason I wanted to launch the summit is just to create a high integrity uh, event where you could come and get high quality information, where you're not going to get sold on some you know, $10,000 packet, mastermind package or funnel where you can actually come uh, and, and learn and get high quality information. And then you can choose how you want to live your life. And that's an important piece and thread that we'll talk through here. We're going to talk about the seven steps to financial freedom uh, for this year, but I wanted to cover the several, seven levels just as I see them. So give you a little context. First level, clarity, when you figure out where you are. Level two, self-sufficiency when you've earned enough money to cover your expenses. Level three, breathing room, when you can escape living paycheck to paycheck. And it's important to note these seven levels, while you might have your own levels, it's really important to not get ahead of yourself when pursuing financial freedom. So I hear this all the time. People reach out and they say, I want to be a millionaire. I want to retire early. I want to have a six-figure job. And then I ask them, well, where are you at now? And they say, you know, I, I have, you know, two months of expenses saved or I have $5,000 saved. And here they are thinking about this huge goal when in realities, uh, you know, you don't want to miss taking that next step. And that next step is actually the most important. And so escaping living paycheck to paycheck, it is the next step if you're currently in debt and living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, you don't want to get ahead of yourself too quickly because oftentimes when we set such large goals, then we just don't take that first step. So uh, stability, when you have six months of living expenses, flexibility, when you have two years of living expenses invested, financial independence is level six. When you live off the income generated by your investments forever, we're going to talk about that a little bit more. And then seven is abundant wealth, when you have more money than you'll ever need and you can spend your time giving away your money, uh, building a legacy plan. But now I want to dive into really the four components of building wealth. There's earning money, there's saving money, there's investment growth, and then there's being tax efficient. So minimizing your taxes. We're going to talk a fair amount about each of these in the rest of the webinar. But I wanted to explain these levers a little bit, because when it comes to pursuing financial freedom, you actually have probably more control than you think and then you realize. And we're going to talk about some of those trade-offs uh, that you might need to make. And so there's really many versions of financial freedom. You know, you can save up a lot of money and live off the interest for the rest of your life, you know, a million dollars or two million dollars. Uh, you can create passive income streams, things like real estate, rental income uh, that cover your living expenses. You can do a hybrid of the two. You can save up a year of expenses just so you can take six months off 
and travel and figure out what you want to do next. If you find a job that you love, I hear this often. People are like, well, you know, I love my job. I don't want to retire early. I like what I do. Uh, Congratulations, you've won the game. There's no one size fits all of financial freedom. It's important for you to choose your own adventure, have a relationship with money, realize that it's going to change as you change and, and have some fun with it. Let's dive into the seven steps. Number one, what does financial freedom mean to you? And so this is really essential to think about because uh, it it means something different to everybody. I asked this question when I was promoting my book. I asked this question on Twitter last week and got over 400 responses. And a lot of them are really different. One person was getting out of debt. Another person said being able to have enough money to spend time with my mother who's getting older. Another one said having enough money to save my kids to college. Another one said being able to have enough money to leave my full-time job uh, to spend more time with my kids who are growing up. Another person said I want to have enough money to be able to travel the world for a year. And it really runs the spectrum. And so it's important to always think about what does financial freedom mean to you? What kind of life do you really want? Because before you answer this question, it's so easy to get caught in always chasing more money, always chasing the next promotion, always trying to maybe buy the next thing. And so what kind of life do you really want? Um, And then thinking about more versus enough. And so more often is the default, but I've talked about this before. When I actually made a list of the things that make me happiest in life, and I've shared this exercise before, a lot of the things that make me happiest, playing guitar, with my friends, playing board games with my wife, walking my dog in the park on a Saturday. A lot of the things that I enjoy, reading books, writing, are pretty inexpensive or actually completely free. And so once I realized that, I decided and started to design my life so I had more time to do the things that I loved as opposed to uh, just trying to make more and more money. So I actually... Uh, you know, had a successful business that I walked away from simply so I could have more time to do the things that I love, to find my passion. And it's really important to figure out what kind of life you want to live. And then after you figure out what kind of life you want to live, fitting in your money life to support that. And we often get it backwards. It's often how much money do I need for the rest of my life? When the first question should be what kind of life do you want to live? And then figuring out how much money you need. And then based on that, the less money that you need to live on, the less money that you need to save. So if your monthly expenses are $2,000 a month, you need to save a lot less money to reach financial freedom than someone who spends $10,000 a month. And there's so few things that we actually control in life, but money is one of those areas where I truly do believe it's a pathway to freedom and that it gives us the opportunity to create more time and space and options and more control in our life. And it's so incredible that we live in the time we live in now because there are so many opportunities to make that happen. Freedom, actually, it only exists within limits. But it's also really important to think about your life and realize the limits to your life as well. So no matter how hard I try, I'm never going to be able to run a four-minute mile. It's just not going to happen. It's not physically how I'm built. I don't have the dedication. And so that's just one example where we often see stories you know, uh, online, even people who read my story and they're like, I want to be a millionaire by 30. I want to reach financial independence by 30. I want to do what you did. But they don't realize, and I try to be transparent about this, that when I was pursuing financial independence, I literally had no life. Uh, It's all I was doing. I lost friendships. I lost some of my health. I made huge trade-offs. And so when people tell me, hey, you know, I want to do what you did, uh, I I always try to caveat it with, you know, I made a lot of trade-offs that I regret and wish I wouldn't have made. You need to choose to live your life. And I'm just an extreme example in a lot of cases of, of this idea it's much better to find your own limits to, to, to make your own trade-offs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And it's also important to check in regularly with yourself because it's one of those things where oftentimes 
we're changing, but we're not checking in with ourselves. So we don't realize that maybe something that we thought we wanted and a trade-off we wanted to make, we no longer should be making because of inertia. You know, it's like you work hard, you go to law school or you get a job and you start getting more and more money and you feel like, well, I worked hard to get this raise. And so then you wait for the next raise and then you stay at a job that actually doesn't make you happy and your life isn't any richer because you feel like you have to stay because you worked so hard to get where uh, where you are. But life is short. Time is more valuable than money. Recalibrate. Be honest with yourself. Pivot if you need to pivot. Number two, check in with your money for 30 minutes a month. And so this is something that I just wanted to double down on and recommend for this year because I still see far too many people who, you know, check their money really infrequently. And so uh, if you've read Financial Freedom, you know, I actually recommend that you check your money five minutes a day, counter to popular wisdom, which says that you should check it once a month. I do it every day because, uh, you know, money to me, it's a, it's a relationship. And so I want to spend more time looking at my money and thinking about my money. It makes when the stock market goes up or down because I spend a little time every day with my money. I don't freak out when the market drops uh, or when something happens. And so I like to spend some time every day, but at a minimum, you should spend at least 30 minutes a month with your money. So gathering up all your debt, being clear on how much you owe, getting clear on where you're currently at, calculating or updating your net worth, calculating how much money you're actually making. So this is one of the things that I wrote a lot about in the book, and I think it's very important. Uh, Vicki Robin, the author of Your Money or Your Life, came up with, with this calculation, figuring out how much money you actually make after you take out things like uh, time for commuting and getting ready. You likely make a lot less money than you think, but it's important to figure out what that number is. Calculating your savings rate, looking at your expenses from 2019, it's a great time now as you start getting together all of your paperwork to put your taxes together, or send it to your accountant or to put it uh, in your online tax tool. Uh, really start to look at what you spent last year and think about how it made you feel. Uh, this is one of the things that I really like to do. Reflecting back, I can analyze what I spent and think about, did this make me happy? Was this worth it? Uh, would I have changed anything about it? And a lot of this is about becoming more mindful with your money. And as you have a relationship with it, you have to spend time with it. Do you regret that purchase? Would you do that again? That's how you start to build a relationship with money. Check to see if there are any better interest rates. I see over and over, you know, people with student loans who should have refinanced or consolidated their student loans, uh, people with credit card debt who, although I don't typically recommend it, you could uh, transfer to a 0% APR card while you're making a strategy to pay it down. Uh, mortgage rates, uh, you can still get some great mortgage refinance rates right now. Just, just it's worth doing a simple search to see what's available out there because you could potentially be saving uh, saving quite a bit of money, especially if you have debt uh, and you want to pay it down. Um, and then the last thing, pull out your job offer letter and your benefits guide for your full-time job. This is something that's really important. You're getting paid to do a specific job, which is hopefully outlined in your job letter. Look again at those responsibilities. If you've gone above and beyond, those are things that you want to note. That's information that you want to use when you go and ask for a raise. Uh, also, looking at your benefits guide. Uh, most employees aren't taking full advantage of their benefits. Pull out that guide. Schedule a quick meeting with your head of HR or someone in your HR department and just ask the simple question, am I making the most of the benefits that I have offered to me? Maybe you've been at your company a couple of years and they've added new benefits that you don't know about. A lot of people leave money on the table by not taking full advantage of the benefits of their company. So very quickly, how to calculate your net worth. It's your financial scorecard. It's your assets minus your liabilities, your assets. It's anything that you can sell that's of value, things like your investments, your house, your furniture, minus your liabilities, which is anything you owe, any type of debt. Um, there's a lot of different net worth calculators out there. There's one on the financialfreedombook.com 
slash tools area of the website. It's here. You can plug everything in on your phone and calculate it. Uh, very important to get clear on your net worth. Two great apps that I use, Mint, it's completely free. Personal Capital, it's completely free. I track my net worth. I've been doing that for the past uh, eight years on uh, mint.com uh, and with the Mint app. Track your net worth. It's your financial scorecard. doesn't matter how much money you make. What matters most is your net worth. Is it going up? Are you worth more than your debt? Track your net worth, extremely important. The other thing you want to calculate, your real, real hourly wage, how much money you're actually making. And so this is something I also built another calculator at financialfreedombook.com slash tools. Uh, it's the real hourly wage calculator. Simple idea, when you factor in things like commuting, getting ready, uh, time traveling to clients, time shopping for work, time decompressing from work, any time that you would have spent differently if you didn't have to work for, for a living, you should factor that into your real hourly rate. Um, you know, this guy, Matt, who is a friend of mine, is a management consultant. He reached out, uh, you know, once I started writing about money and, uh, you know, he's like, you know, I'm really stressed with my job. I want to spend more time with my kids. He was making over $200,000 per year. And when we actually looked at his numbers because he had to travel uh, every week for work and all that travel time he would have spent with his family. He would have spent it differently. When all that got factored in, he was only making about $30 per hour. Uh, he quickly left his full-time job and actually got a job at a nonprofit w- making less of a salary, but his hourly rate went up. So the time, the amount of money that he was trading for his time actually went up and he was able to spend Fridays with his kids. You know, he had a lot more flexibility and the amount of time that he was working was less and his salary was less, but how much he was making per hour was actually a lot higher than, than when he had this $200,000 job. So you want to make sure that you're comparing apples to apples uh, when evaluating job opportunities, the ROI of your side hustle. And the way you do that is by understanding your real hourly rate. And you can you know calculate that using the calculator that I built at Financial Freedom Book dot com slash tools. And then last but not least, your savings rate. So your savings rate is the total percentage. So you've got your net worth, which is your scorecard, your assets minus your liabilities, your real hourly rate, which is how much you're basically trading your time, time of your life, an hour of your life that you're never going to get back, how much you're trading that for, for money. And then finally, your savings rate, which is your percentage of your income that you're saving in all of your accounts. And so this is the third most important number in your financial life. And you want to monitor all three of these things. And your savings rate, there's a direct correlation between how much money you're saving, the percentage of your income, and the years that it's going to take you to reach financial independence. The average person in the United States saves less than 3% of their income. It's why most people are living paycheck to paycheck, and they're never going to be able to retire. It's really important to understand how much you save. I calculate mine in percentages and in dollars. I built this simple calculator uh, at the same website, financialfreedombook.com slash tools. You don't have to buy the book. You don't have to own the book to use the tools. They're all free. They work on your phone. Check them out. Thousands of people use them every month uh, to calculate. They're super simple, super easy to use. And so you can just plug in how much money you're saving in each account. You can do this once a month. You can do this once a year. It actually calculates Uh, how long it's going to take you to reach financial independence. So those are really, really important. This is just something that uh, I built off of the Mr. Money Mustache model, which is how uh, many years uh, do you have to work to save one year of living expenses based on your savings rate? So you can see that if you're saving 10% of your income, it takes nine years of work to save up one year of living expenses. But if you get your savings rate to 25, say 50%, uh, you know, it takes a lot less time. So there's a direct correlation between your savings rate and the time that it takes you to reach financial independence. After you think about what financial freedom means to you, what kind of life you want to live, you get clear on where you're at, you calculate your net worth, your uh, real hourly rate, and your savings rate. The third thing that you should do is really think about what trade offs are you willing to make. And so we know that. Money and time are actually not equal, even though 
that's often talked about. Money is time. Time is money. Time is actually so much more valuable than money. You know, you're not going to be able to go back in five years and watch your, you know, little toddler have their third birthday again, or, you know, your, your time itself is, it's always moving. We can't stop it. And so whenever you're working for money, uh, you're trading time that you're not going to be able to get back for money, which is something that, especially in the time that we're living in, you can probably go out and make extra money in some way but you can't get back your time. So under figuring out when you're willing to make the trade-off. So if you take a job with a higher salary, oftentimes if you get that raise or that new job or that promotion, it comes with expectations from your boss, your boss's boss, uh, and they expect you to spend more time. And so one of the coolest trends that I see happening now, and there's some data out there about this, actually more and more millennials are rejecting salary increases because it comes with increased responsibility and thus more time that they would need to spend working more stress. And so it's not always about chasing more and more money. It's about is money helping you live a life that you enjoy, that you love? I always say saving is an opportunity. It's not a sacrifice. Saving is how you ultimately reach financial freedom. And I encourage you to think about why you want more money in the first place, because it's naturally it was hardwired in me. It was hard. It's hardwired in a lot of people to just always go and, you know, chase more money or try to make more money. But in reality, time is so much more limited than money. You can always go out and make more money. So what trade off are you willing to make? And none of the freedom matters if you actually don't take advantage of this. So I see a lot of people pursuing financial freedom. They're saving more and more money. I was like this. Once I started on my journey, I just kept trying to invest, trying to save more money. I just didn't stop. When in reality, a lot of the freedom that I was craving, I had two years, three years before. I didn't need to save a million dollars to have more time and space and freedom in my life. I wish I would have noticed that. That's why it's important to always check in with where you're at in your financial life and adapt. And just think about, am I willing to make a trade-off? You know, a lot of people stay in really toxic jobs that they hate because they feel like there are no other options. When once again, based on the data, there are more jobs available than ever before. It's never been easier to pivot to a new career. There's often just this irrational fear around leaving a job when in a lot of cases, you can always go back or always get kind of a similar job to the one you have. What you can't get back is the 10 years that maybe you didn't pursue your dream or do something that just would have made you a lot happier, even if it made you less money. So getting to know money makes understanding and making those trade-offs a lot easier to make. Number four, pick your budgeting style. So for those of you who know me, I'm pretty anti-budget. I like to keep it really simple, but it's important to pick the style that works for you. So now that you've thought about what financial freedom means to you, you've gotten clear on where you're at. Now you really want to pick your budgeting style because budgeting, getting granular is ultimately what's going to help you get clarity on where you're at and give you some tools moving forward. So there's three pretty simple budgeting approaches. There's so many out there. Approach number one, save on your three biggest expense categories. Set the amount of money that you're investing automatically and keep it simple. I'm going to talk. I'm going to go in depth with that strategy. Number two, focus on ap optimizing your categories one by one over time. And after three months, you'll have optimized all of your expense categories. So this is a, a little bit more of a granular approach, but isn't kind of having a, you know, a spreadsheet that you're looking at every month or every day. The way that this works is you just pick a few areas of your life and you look at how you're spending and you adjust them over time. So within six months to a year, you've built the right budget for you. You, you didn't have to jump in to the deep end of the pool or work out seven days a week. You know, you can ease yourself into it. And then number three, tracking all of your expenses in a spreadsheet. Uh, or a tool like YNAB is a good one. And, you know, this is kind of the traditional bu budgeting method. But the one that I am most a fan of is saving the most money where you spend the most money. And so the average American spends 70% of their income, their after tax income on housing, transportation, and food. And that's because you spend the most amount of money. That's where you can ultimately save the most amount of money. And 
you know, moving to a smaller apartment, buying a used car, not having a car, cooking at home, buying bulk groceries, keeping your food costs low. It's actually pretty interesting. I Even though I moved to New York and I live in New York now, I actually spend less money on food in New York than I did in Chicago because it's so competitive. The restaurant market is so competitive here. You can just get world-class food a lot cheaper than anywhere else that I've found in the United States, which is something that I didn't expect. And so I want to talk about just the compounding impact of some of these small decisions, because we often think, oh, you know, just moving to a smaller apartment or just driving a used car. Our mind, it's hard to conceptualize how much money that could actually save us. And so it's important to think about some of these calculations. And so I did a simple example, and this was in my own life. I used to live in a $1,500 a month apartment uh, back in 2011 in Chicago, and I was spending quite a bit of money on my rent. Now in some cities, you know, 1500 is a deal, but in Chicago at the time, you know, that was a lot of money for rent. And so I actually made the decision just to cut out that part of that biggest expense. And so I moved to an $800 a month apartment. And, and these are, you know, real numbers here. So I didn't end up living there for five years, but the simple example of just moving from a $1,500 a month apartment to an $800 a month apartment over the next 30 years, it adds up to a massive amount of savings. And that so that one decision for five years, you know, we're not talking about living in an $800 a month apartment forever. It's just five years. That one decision over 30 years at 7% compounding, which is a somewhat aggressive investment return based on what I think is going to happen in the future. But, you know, based on the past, you know, 50 to 100 years, 7, 7.2% is the average inflation adjusted return of the US stock market. And so using that, just that one decision over 30 years, you know, would increase your net worth by over $300,000. And so being able to calculate and think about money over the long term, these small decisions, this is what moves the needle. I mean, this is what get you the freedom over time. You know, house hacking, I'm not going to dive into this. This is one of my favorite strategies to completely reduce or eliminate your housing expense. There's many types of house hacking. You can read about it. Uh, There's a great book by Craig Kurlop, wrote a book that came out last year called The House Hacking Strategy. It outlines very simply uh, how to house hack, how to use your home as a path to financial freedom. It's a great book that I recommend. I write about it in in Financial Freedom as well, but Craig goes into a lot more depth than I do in in my book. Learn about house hacking, rent a three-bedroom or four-bedroom instead of a two-bedroom, especially if you're young, offset the cost of your living expense as long as you can and invest the difference. Do that for a couple years and you've increased your network by hundreds of thousands of dollars. And you don't have to do it forever. That's an important thing as well. You know, I often mention that the next three to five years of your financial life are the most important because what you want to do right now is is save as much money as you can so you can get that money growing for you over time. And so back in the day, you know, when I did this in 2011, that money now has just continued to grow and is still growing and will continue to grow hopefully for the next 30, 40 years, depending upon how long I live, just because that one decision. And so I I just can't reiterate that enough. And the same example of just buying a used versus a new car. The average American, uh, it takes a year of their life to to buy a new car. They work an entire year of their life to buy a new car. And if if that brings you a lot of joy, that makes you happy, by all means, do it. Just realize the trade-off that you're making. But if if they would have invested that $40,000 instead and maybe drove a $2,000 car, over 30 years, that money would be worth over $280,000. So just those two simple decisions, moving to an $800 a month apartment and buying a used car instead of a new car, they're going to be six to $700,000 richer in 30 years. That's an insane amount of money just from making two small decisions. And the thing about most of us, you know, we buy a new car, say every 10 years or five years, instead of trying to decrease our expenses for a period and saving that money, we just keep spending more and more. And so a few of these simple changes, another piece, the average car costs $8,469 a year to own. If you invest that money 
that's another like say you invest that money each year and you carpool or you know you just take lift or you take the bus or you walk to work or you work remotely so you don't have to commute i mean that's another $250,000 that you could have saved at least you know so just those three decisions you know is almost $900,000 that you'll have in 30 years i mean that's enough for most people to retire and that's just from making a, two decisions to move to a smaller apartment for 5 years and drive a used car instead of a new. And this is just meant to illustrate that just a couple of doing a couple of things the right way makes a massive impact over time. And when you do four or five things well, I mean, that's all you need to do. And and that's, it's really important to, when you're thinking about these things, and that's why I put this chart together, you know, you can see on the left side, the net impact of say, reducing your housing expense by $500, reducing your transportation expense by 100, your other expenses by 500. So say you're saving an additional, you know, $1,200 a month or $14,000 a year. The impact of saving $14,000 per year, you know, as you're making more money, I think a lot of people can do that, you know, if they stretch a little bit, just that money, you know, over 30 years, you're going to have almost $1.5 million. And then on top of that, if you invest your raises, if you side hustle and you invest your side hustle income uh, here on the right side, your investing income, if you add all that up, that just increases the impact even more. So just just putting your raises away. I mean, you can see just a couple decisions here. You know, you'd have one point eight million dollars in 30 years. So, uh, you know, this isn't rocket science. It's just making a couple of good decisions over and over. And so it's important for you to think about your life going back to those levers. Which ones do you want to push? What trade-offs are you willing to make? Maybe you want a house hack for a couple of years and live in a crappy apartment or drive a crappy car like I did. So you can save up $300,000, which over the next 30 years could be a couple of million. But you have to decide what trade-offs you're willing to make. So you know, here are a couple of variables to think about what's going to have the biggest impact. Two sides of the same coin, making money and saving money. Oftentimes with personal finance in the money world, we write so much about cutting back, so much about frugality, spending less. But in my opinion, there's a limit to how much you can can cut back. There's not you know, as much of a limit to how much money you can make. And so going out and trying to make $300,000 uh, is probably going to have a bigger impact than, for example, cutting your expenses by $5,000, especially because incomes tend to increase. There's more opportunity to invest, more opportunity for your money to grow. So that's why I write so much about making more money, optimizing your full-time job, side hustling. We're going to talk about that in a second. But how much you make, how much you spend, how much you save, how much you invest, how much you save in taxes. Taxes is one of those things, just investing in the right accounts the right way. I write a lot about this in Financial Freedom. We're going to talk a lot at the Financial Freedom Summit about all six of these, because the idea at the summit is learning just a few takeaways from the event can have literally a million dollar impact or more over the next 30 years. And the idea is, is taking a few from each of these buckets. And the, the sum is so much greater than the parts. Uh, but thinking about how much money you make, how much you spend, save, invest, and trying to optimize as many of the areas as you can in your life. So number five, optimizing your full-time job in your career. This is one of those things that I just can't harp on enough. Most people just, they if you like your job, you don't like your job, no matter what, your job is where you're getting paid the most amount of money likely right now. And so you want to first make sure that you're getting as much money as you can out of your full-time job, just so you're making the most of the opportunity. The average commute in the United States is over an hour each way. If you're going to sit in traffic or sit on the train or sit on the bus and go to a job and trade that time for your job, you need to make sure you're making as much money as you can, or at least you feel good about the money that you're making in your full-time job. And so that's where you should start. Updating your market value, your value to your company. I'm going to show you how to do that real quickly. Connecting with recruiters in your industry, evaluating new skills, switching jobs for a potential higher ROI, continuing to learn new free skills. Most of the jobs, you know, in 10 to 20 years, they don't even exist yet. And don't be afraid to start over as well. I see a lot of people that just stay in jobs that they hate 
And life is too short to stay in a job that you hate. There are too many jobs. There's too many opportunities. There are too many ways to learn new careers, to pivot. Um, you know, I'm seeing now incredible stories of people who, you know, are in their 40s and their 50s and their 60s taking on a whole entirely new career successfully, uh, changing jobs, taking a little bit of risk. So don't be afraid to start over. Don't be afraid to pivot. If you went to law school and you have law school loans, but you start working for a law firm and you hate it, try another law firm, try a different type of law. If you end up hating the law, cut your losses, do something else. And you know, life is too short to, to not enjoy your job and to not at least feel like you're making a good amount of money for your time. So a few quick ways to do that. Number one, connecting with recruiters in your industry. I can't stress this enough. Recruiters are paid to find you a job and to find companies' employees. They want to give you information and they want to help you make more money. That's literally their job and you don't have to pay them. The companies that hire you or hire people are the people the, the companies pay you don't pay and so connect with recruiters in your industry almost every industry has recruiting firms has recruiters meet three or four of them go out to lunch get to know them they're going to have data about how much money you should be making based on your skills based on uh, your job in your city the, and and a bonus they might even have a job you know i see this time and time again they might even have a job where you can make 20 30 40,000 more dollars tomorrow they might have a company that needs someone with your skill set and just because you reached out to learn a little bit more and connect with them you can be making $40,000 just like that i see people who get new jobs from recruiters quickly all the time and then if you build relationships with them over time even a year down the road they might be like oh i have a perfect job for grant and then they connect you with a job. You, it's creating a little workforce that's out there trying to make you more money. And it's completely free. I think that recruiters are under leveraged by employees, by people with full-time jobs, form relationships with them, simple Google search, recruiter, whatever industry that you're in. And another bonus, even if you don't live in a big city, look for recruiters in big cities. So if you're in the IT industry, connect with recruiters who live in New York City, connect with recruiters uh, who live in Chicago, because they might have a remote opportunity for you. A company in New York might need a remote IT or network administrator, and the salaries for that job in New York are 30% higher than they are in Omaha, where you live. And so because you connected with a recruiter in New York, they got you a New York salary job, and you live in Omaha where your cost of living is lower. So get creative. Not that hard. Sends a couple emails. They want to be friends with you because they make money when they get you a job. Review the reports that they put out. They put out good reports. Of course, monitor LinkedIn, Indeed, Glassdoor, all these great salary comparison websites. I love the trend that I'm seeing now. I don't know if you saw it in the journalism space, but there's this movement for salary transparency. And so more and more people now are sharing their salaries anonymously. So if you're a journalist, just go out and find that. There's a Google Doc, I think it has like 2,000 journalist salaries at all the different publications. And so people can see based on how much experience uh, they have, you know, how much money that they comparatively should be making. Uh, and then connect with competitor companies. This is a no brainer. Talk to an HR person at a competitor company. They might have a job for you, or at least they're going to give you some more information on how much money you should be making. Maximize your salary by analyzing your value to your company. This is an important thing to do. A lot of times your company would pay you a 20 or 30% raise just to keep you because it's actually hard to uh, you know, retain talent and keep talent. And so the cost to replace you is extremely high, extremely high for most companies. Just asking for a raise ultimately can, can get you one. And I talk a lot in, in the book about very specific strategies for tracking when you go above and beyond your job, keeping notes from what recruiters tell you. And just, you know, we spend more time planning for our vacations than we do optimizing our careers. And that's just a simple fact. So getting to know your industry, what you should be getting paid has a massive ROI over time. And then just switching jobs. And so this is a simple chart where a 1% salary difference, so say your salary goes 4% per year instead of 3% or 3% instead of 4%, that over 30 years 
can you know have a massive impact. So every 1% of raise that you get, and it's often easier to get a raise when you switch companies. And the reason why is because when always you're, when you're switching jobs, your market value gets reanalyzed by the company that's looking to hire you. So there's it could be smart to just pop around jobs. And the impact of that over your career could mean you know you have three hundred to five hundred thousand dollars more invested over time. So number six, evaluate your side hustle. Oh, I get I talk a lot about side hustling. I think a lot of people think about side hustling wrong. I think a lot of side hustles are a complete waste of time. And you have to get a little bit more information. That's why calculating your real hourly wage and comparing it to your real hourly wage for your side hustle, that can help you evaluate whether it's worth that amount of time. So are you side hustling to invest? Uh, what's your goal with side hustling? Are you building new skills? Are you in control of your time and your pay? Are you trying new ideas? And then being honest with yourself about was the trade-off ultimately worth it? Because a lot of times we spend a lot of time on our side hustle that in reality, maybe we didn't make as much money as we wanted, or we could have spent that time a little bit better. You know, here are kind of the nine recommendations for finding the perfect side hustle. How much time do you have? What are your hobbies and skills? Uh, do you want to sell a product, a service, or both? Is there demand for the opportunity? You know, you're always going to make more money when you control your time and your pay, as opposed to driving for Lyft or Uber. They set your wages. You don't set your own. All you can do is work more time, and there's only so many hours in the day. How much is someone willing to pay for what you're offering? Can you sell it? You know, starting a side hustle is is starting a little business, and so uh, it's really important to evaluate it just like any other job or any other income opportunity and decide whether it's worth it. Because I see a lot of people doing side hustles that aren't making them as much money as they could be making, or it's just not worth the time. It's just it's just stressing them out. And so evaluating whether your side hustle is ultimately worth it, one of the recommendations for 2020, uh, because I see a lot of people doing side hustles that uh, you know really aren't teaching them anything. They're not making enough money. And they're not they're not really moving forward. And then finally, last but not least, uh, all of this money that you know you increase your salary, you optimize your expenses, you get a sense for where you're at, continuing to invest. And so you know people have been talking about we're going to be in a recession. You know people have been worried about the recession for the past five or six years. Uh, you know I remember in 2015 when all the the news articles were recessions coming or recessions coming. And, you know, we've just continued to see a bull market, the longest bull market in history. Of course, we can't predict the future, but I still see far too many people sitting on the sidelines, not investing, not starting to invest. Investing is not ga gambling. It's not very complicated. The first step is to separate your short and your long-term investments. This is the biggest mistake that I see people making. They view investing as the same bucket of money, but you need to separate into two buckets. Money you need in five years or less. So things like for a down payment on a house, tuition, for a vacation, for education expenses, that's money that you want to keep in a high interest online savings account. Ally Bank has a good one. CIT Bank has a good one. Schwab has a good one. Uh, you want to at least try to get, you know, the, the interest rate now is around uh, 1.7 to 1.8. Most people, Americans, lose over $50 billion in interest, leaving their money in savings accounts that return 0.01%. So at least put your short-term cash, your emergency fund, in a high-interest online savings account. And then for the long-term money you need for retirement, for the future, you want to be maxing out your 401k or 403b or IRA to get those tax advantages. I talk a lot about how to do that in the book. We're going to have a number of investing sessions uh, at the summit as well to help answer your questions. But the money for the long term, stocks, bonds, real estate, and stick with what's tried and true. Stay away from the cryptocurrency. Stay away from you know the marijuana stocks and individual stock buying and investing in anything speculative. Stocks, bonds, real estates have the best long-term historic performance. Read a little bit more about investing. You can read in my book. Another great book on investing uh, that I like is uh, The Bogleheads 
guide to investing. This is one of my favorite uh, investing books. If you're a beginner, if you're a little more advanced, it is the simplest, best uh, investing book, in my opinion, out there. So check it out. But yeah, invest and keep investing. Don't worry about the ups and the downs, the recession, if the market's going to fall next year. Investing consistently over time and continuing to invest is the most important. You can't time the market. You just want to want to want to stay on it. So in, invest as much as you can in your 401k. One of the strategies I recommend is every 30 days you can actually talk to your HR department uh, in a lot of 401ks and have them set your account so it'll increase 1% more of your salary every 30 days or every 90 days. And that's a simple way to start saving more money without even feeling it. 1% every 30 days, you're not going to notice. And by the end of the year, you're going to be saving 12 more percent of your income and you'll have cut you know, probably a decade off the years that it'll take you to get reach financial independence. So uh, 1% more every 30 days, try to invest as much as you can. You know, I'm a huge fan of that. And then monitor your investments and stay the course. And so going back to the idea that money is not a tool, money, you should have a relationship with money, get to know it, spend some time, get to know your investments, what you're invested in. The more that you learn, of course, like anything, the easier it's going to be to make decisions and also the easier it's going to be uh, to change course if you need to. So summary of the seven steps, what does financial freedom mean to you? Check in with your money uh, for at least 30 minutes a month at minimum. I do it five minutes every day. Number three, figure out what trade-offs you're willing to make. Everything in life is a trade-off. You can't be playing a pickup basketball game at the same time that you're watching a Netflix show at the same time that you're learning a new skill online. You have to make choices, of course, about how you want to spend your time. And I tend to believe that trying to go out and build new skills, make more money, optimize your full-time job, ends up having a bigger compounding benefit than simply cutting back. But if you do both, and you invest the difference. You know, I talked about how just a couple small decisions can have a massive impact and give you more options. Uh, you know, in your life, just drive a used car, don't drive a car at all, move to a smaller apartment, live with your parents for a while. You don't have to do it forever. I actually kept my $800 car until I'd saved $1.25 million, and then I bought a used Lexus, and so I was able to buy my dream car. And I paid cash for it. I bought it used. I ended up getting my Lexus for uh, less than a Nissan Murano. So I did get a good deal. But, uh, you know, I waited until I got to that goal and I didn't have to drive the $800 car, you know, forever. So what trade-offs are you willing to make now, realizing that they'll change as you change and that you have so much more control than perhaps you realize? Pick your budgeting style. I keep it simple. I don't look at the money coming in and out that closely. I just try to keep my housing, my transportation, and my food costs low, and then I invest the difference. Optimize your full-time job. You're going to be able, just like you're going to be able to save the most amount of money where you spend the most amount of money, you're going to be able to make the most amount of money right now where you make the most amount of money. And so optimizing your full-time job and your career, spending more time on your career development analyzing how much money you could make with different career tracks, building those skills. I talk a lot about that in Financial Freedom. I'm so excited at the summit because there's going to be so many different people from so many different career tracks, you know, from doctors to lawyers to teachers to, you know, all walks of life. And that's what I'm most excited about because no matter what job you have, there's probably going to be a couple people at least who are in the same career as you and you can team up and, and learn from each other. Uh, or if you want to pivot into a new industry, there's going to be people there probably as well. Evaluate your side hustle idea. Double down on you know 2020. There are so many ways to make money. Now I see a lot of people getting distracted and, and trading their time for less money than they realize because they don't know really how much time they're actually spending or they're doing a side hustle that they don't like. And just like you don't want to stay at a job or you shouldn't stay at a job that you don't like, same thing with side hustling and, and probably even worse, doing a side hustle that you don't like. That's your free time that you're spending. And so be extra, extra critical and take extra care to evaluate whether a side hustle is worth it. And then finally, separate your short term and your long term investing into two different buckets in your short term. 
save the money, your emergency fund, six months of expenses. If you don't have six months of expenses saved, that's your first goal, no matter how long it takes you. Once you get to six months, get to a year. Once you get to a year, get to two years. Don't worry about the million dollars. Don't worry about financial independence. Don't worry about retiring early. Just get to that next goal. Get to that next level of financial freedom. Once you get there, see how you feel, reevaluate, take advantage of the freedom. The freedom doesn't matter. None of it matters if you're not taking advantage of it. And so if you save up your expenses and you hate your job, quit your job, go do something else for six months, go travel. Remember, time is so much more valuable than money. Those are the seven steps to financial freedom in 2020. Hope to see you at the Financial Freedom Summit. Everything we talked about today is going to be talked about over two days. There are people who know more about house hacking than me, know more about investing than me, know more about optimizing their expenses than me. You know, these are all of my friends who, you know, I think are, have just written incredible books. They're doing an incredible job. They have incredible blueprints. That's one of those things just learning from other people who've done it, being able to walk up to them, ask them a question, being able to connect with them, being able to connect with others who are on the journey. I've learned so much from so many people on my own journey. I could not have done this alone, whether it's from bloggers or other writers or other people I've met along the way. My financial strategy, my life blueprint is the amalgamation of all the people that I've met and connected with. And I wish this summit existed when I was pursuing financial independence. I would have been there without a doubt. I'm just as pumped uh, probably as, as, as anyone who's attending because I'm excited to still continue learning. I get inspired every day by people that reach out to me, people that I meet that are choosing to live life on their own way in their own terms. I just chatted with Christy and Bryce uh, from Millennial Revolution who authors of Quit Like a Millionaire. They're going to be at the summit as well. They wrote an awesome, awesome book. They're good friends of mine. They travel the world full time. They retired in their early 30s. Incredible uh, investing strategies. Know more about geo arbitrage than anyone uh, that I've ever met. They're going to be given one of the keynotes. They're going to be doing a breakout session on their investing strategy and how to how to travel basically for less money forever than you know living in a city so they're going to do a keynote a breakout session a book signing a Q&A and the cool thing about the summit is we're you know all of us are going to be there we're going to be accessible you can ask me questions i'm going to be doing a couple talks and you know Vicky Robin uh you know, who who came up with so much of this and is my mentor and, and dear friend. She's going to be there keynoting and doing a couple sessions. Uh, and it, it's going to be amazing. We have over 50 speakers who are just completely open and literally the nicest people that I've met in my entire life. And the cool thing about, you know, founding a summit is I get to invite who I want. And I'm only inviting who I think are the best people in this space. And I'm so excited that just learning from uh, you know, a couple of things from a couple of them will just have a massive impact, you know, hopefully on your life over time. And, you know, we're building a community. I mean, that's also what it's about is, you know, learning from the other people who are in attendance. And, you know, we're all on this journey together. You know, we live in a world now, like I said, more debt than ever before, lower wages, higher cost of living. Yet here, more and more of my friends are living incredibly awesome lives and living passionate, fully alive lives. And so, that's what I'm really pumped about the summit too, just because I meet people all the time who are, you know, living life very differently than I live. And it's just, it's amazing. It's just amazing, amazing to see. And we live in such a remarkable time. So, you know, if you're interested in this stuff, if you have friends or you have family or you have a partner who like, you know, is skeptical or, you know, isn't on board, you know, it's, it's a great place to bring that person. It's at the Hilton in St. Louis, which is, right across the street from the arch. It's right next to the baseball park. There's awesome restaurants. The hotel is affordable. Flights to St. Louis are affordable. The reason we picked St. Louis is we wanted um, everyone to be able to get a ticket, get flights, get hotels, split it with a friend, you know, to be able to come for seven or $800 or less in total. And so uh, we want to try to keep this as affordable as possible. And it's the first year too. So we want to 
make it, you know, we want you to be a part of creating it as well. And that's really exciting. And there's going to be a number of online events before the summit in May. So you can connect with people uh, before you even show up. And I'm excited about that as well. You know, we want to make sure that you're connected and you know other people uh, or get to meet other people who are going to be there as well. There's going to be free child care, over a thousand people likely. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be awesome. I'm, I'm so stoked. I'm pumped. I hope this is a yearly occurrence. And, you know, we just prove to ev- all the haters out there that that we can reach financial freedom, that there are other paths to success and that, uh, you know, it's never been easier in history to live a life that you love. So next step, sign up for the summit using the freedom code, buy or borrow a copy of my book, Financial Freedom. Number three, rewatch the webinar. I know we covered a lot and, you know, I wish you the best on your journey, no matter where life takes you. Life is too short to not love your life, too short to stay at a job that you're stressed about. All the tools and tactics that we talked about, you know, are, are available and I wish you the best of luck as you continue to learn more and more about this. Hope to see some of you at the summit and really wish you the best on all your journey and an incredible 2020. Uh, Stay tuned because we'll definitely be doing another one of these webinars at some point in the next couple months. I want to keep doing them and and sharing what we know. So I hope you have a good night and uh, take care. Peace, guys.